Greg is a serial entrepreneur, a real estate developer, a mentor to high level investors and entrepreneur. He himself has bought, developed, and sold over $250 million in real estate, has done hundreds of customs, custom homes, commercial buildings, mixed-use subdivisions, and has started, scaled, and exited a dozen companies. So that's a, that's a pretty rare combination to have that deep of experience in real estate and that deep of experience in companies. And I think that's why he has such a, such a business mind, right, that Basically, real estate is one of the simplest ways in capitalism that you can transact a business. And because he has both the real estate experience and the business experience, that's how he thinks. And in terms of offer and P&L and how to optimize performance, it comes from that deep experience. He's also a coach and mentor to many top entrepreneurs, real estate investors, developers, people like Nick and I at Black Swan, um, Vikram Raya, who many of you know, Joe Fairless, who many of you would recognize, many other names that you would recognize in this industry. Greg has been involved in over $2 billion, billion with a B, in um, deals in process and assets currently under management. So a huge number. My favorite thing about Greg is when we would have our coaching calls, he's always like in the car. He's always like at a job site, just finished with a broker, um, just met with a property manager, just met with a real estate investor. And I appreciate that a great deal. Um, there are some coaches that use coaching as a way to exit the active part of whatever it is that they're coaching about, real estate, business, lemonade stands, whatever. And there's still a ton of value there. Don't get me wrong. But there's there's something very special about someone who is in the thick of it with you that isn't just reflecting on expertise that they you know, gathered up over the last several decades, but has all of that expertise and is actively writing offers, actively analyzing properties, actively renovating things. And that just always gave me so much faith in the guidance that he was offering us because things have really been moving, right? The pace of change, you hear me say this over and over and over again, the pace of change over the last you know, 20 years with computers and the internet, but really over the last five years with the global pandemic and with artificial intelligence is so fast. And so having a coach who not only has decades of experience, but is in the thick of it right there in that change has just been so invaluable. That's my introduction for Greg. Let me go ahead and spotlight Greg here for everyone. How are you tonight, Greg? Doing great, Elaine. Thanks for having me. Good to see everybody. Yeah, good to see you. I'm excited about tonight. Um, so for everyone listening, kind of what I was thinking we would do tonight is I have maybe seven or eight questions here. Greg and I have not pre-planned any of this because I wanted you to see his quick thinking, the way he brings real estate concepts together. Um so I have questions that I think are kind of what I think would be like the most frequently asked questions, the most applicable to everyone here. And then after that, we'll just open the floor. How does that sound for everyone? Does that sound good for you, Greg? Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. All right. Well, I know I just did your introduction there, but why don't we start? Why don't you introduce yourself to us? Maybe give us a little more history and context of your real estate journey. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm an entrepreneur first. So serial entrepreneur, real estate investor and developer. And, you know, like you said, you know, 250 million, that was my own funds, no partners, no investors. That just that was just me using cash flow for my businesses, then hundreds of millions with investor capital and, you know, building, scaling and exiting 12 different companies. So, you know, it's all about leadership, delegation, motivation. I teach people how to be leaders, delegators, motivators. And like you said, think from a business standpoint first, you know, real estate can be emotional for a lot of people, but it's a business. At the end of the day, it's dollars in, dollars out, income and expenses. It's really that simple in terms of the fundamentals of business. Um, you know, I've started my full-time entrepreneurial journey in 1997. This is my third business cycle as an investor and entrepreneur. Um, you know, business cycles, as you know, peaks and valleys in the economy, red, you know, fed uh, hiking and cutting cycles, you know, expansion and contraction in the economy in real estate, in the markets, things like that. So, you know, I went through the early 80s, late 90s, I bought my, or early 90s, you know, I bought my first house in 1990. So mid to late 80s, early 90s, you know, starting companies, buying real estate, you know, going through that kind of a lull up until 95, then the peak of the market, 
uh, you know, started booming and, you know, the, the late nineties into the early two thousands. And we saw, you know, 08, 09, you know, and, you know, now here we are again, going through another business cycle. We've been in an expansion here after the, you know, pandemic, which was a, uh, induced, um, recession, you know, it was artificial recession. Uh, so, you know, it's been really, like you said, an interesting journey, but to go back where I started. So I'm a natural born entrepreneur as a kid, you know, if I wanted anything and I'm talking, you know, fourth, fifth grade, sixth grade, if I wanted a thing, like I wanted to take karate lessons, my dad would say, well, you need to go figure out how to make the money and pay for it. So I would go knock on your door. Hey, Elaine, my name is Greg. I live down the street. I need to make some money so I can take karate lessons. I'll cut your grass. I'll wash your car. I'll walk your dog. If you don't have a dog, I'll get you one and then I'll walk him. So, you know, <laughs> whatever it took, that was me. I wasn't afraid to knock on doors and ask for what I was looking for, but provide value first, right? I always provided value first. And I always gave them a reason why I was asking. And that makes a huge difference. And that's a big takeaway. And when you're when you're negotiating, when you're, you know, whatever it is, if you provide that reason for what you're asking, why you're asking, and you uncover the reasons on the other end of what they're asking and why they're asking, that's a big differentiator and you can get people on your side. So I learned at a young age, you know, how that works. And then also as a kid running around in the summers, you know, I was hanging out at bowling alleys and stuff, you know, to kind of stay cool because we lived in Florida, fifth grade to 11th grade. And um, I wanted to, you know, either shoot pool or bowl a little bit. And I was a good bowler as a kid. I had a 180 average as a teenager. So I used to bowl like, you know, with my parents in their league and stuff. But um, so I went to the guy that, you know, owned the bowling alley said, hey, you know, what can I do? I want to play, you know, pool. I want to bowl, but I don't have any money. Can I do anything for you in exchange for some games? He said, sure, go bust tables and, you know, clean up. So, you know, I started learning at a very young age, provide value first, and then you can get what you want in return. Um you know, so fast forward, uh, graduated high school. I went in the Navy right out of high school, went and enlisted, did not go to college, got out of the Navy. And I did two things. I did restaurants and construction. Uh, I got my business training, you know, somewhat in the military. I did retail in the military. So we took care of the ship stores and vending machines and barber shops, the laundries, things like that. So I had some basic, you know, accounting training and, you know, business fundamental training in the military. Then when I got out, uh, I went in the restaurant industry, started as a busboy dishwasher, worked my way up into management. Always had a construction business on the side, doing little handyman remodeling stuff, building cabinets, little decks, fences, whatever. Um, but I got some really great business and leadership training in the restaurant industry. I was with a corporation called Lone Star Steakhouses. We were the fastest growing, most profitable uh, restaurant chain in the in the country at the time during during this huge expansion. And they forced me to read. Well, they didn't force you, but you, you had some required reading and leadership and management development that you had to go through with that company. And there was a series of books that I've everybody that works with me and a couple of my uh, people in my mentorship program are on this. I saw tonight, uh, Peter and Simon, I, I haven't seen who else might be on maybe Gordon, but um, I tell everybody about these fundamental books that I read in terms of leadership, management, delegation, how to become a leader, delegate, a motivator, you know, how to, how to have that business mind. Uh, so I started reading books and, you know, training myself and learning, even though I didn't go to college, I got the training through business, through doing, and through educating myself and investing in myself. And over the years, you know, I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, on my own personal and professional development and education, books, training, seminars, and all of my companies, I would bring in outside consultants for different areas of the company and different things that we were doing, uh, things like that. And, you know, the really cool thing about all of the things that I've done is I didn't do any of it. What I did was I found great people and I coached them to success. I found experts in the fields of the businesses that I, were, I was involved in that did the things that I wanted to do. They had built companies for other people that I wanted to build. And I brought them in on board with me and we built things together. So, you know, that, that was what was really cool about my journey. And like you said, just the background that I have in building so many different companies you know, everything from systems, operations, procedures, marketing, how do you, you know, how do you lead people, manage people? How do you get different kinds of people to work together to produce great results? You know, uh, how do you build a company culture? Uh, how do you create a vision that everybody can get behind? And, you know, that works in real estate deals, that works in businesses, that works in nonprofit. Yeah, I sat on the board, you know, so that journey um, you know, after I got out of the military, uh, you know, like I said, bounced around in restaurants and construction, started my first company in 1997. It was a little remodeling handyman company, moved to the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Again, there were problems that needed to be solved. I couldn't get anybody to do work on my house, just bought a house, moved there. Nobody would call you back. So that's a problem where there's a problem, there's opportunity. So I created a little remodeling handyman company because I had some skills. 
Uh, my first year, we did 250,000 in sales. By seven years later, we were doing 30 million a year. We were one of the largest builder developers in the area, started 12 other companies along the way. And what I did was um, I built companies to generate cash flow to invest in other assets. And that's how I grew and scaled the company. But along the way, during that seven year period, while I was building that company and you know 12 other companies and doing hundreds of millions of real estate deals, I also sat on the boards of several nonprofits. I was uh, on the board chairman of the board of trustees of my church. I taught Sunday school. I, you know, I was a youth group leader. Um, I coached all of my kids' sports. I had three girls. They played every sport all year round, and I was coaching, you know, something for all of them. And I was at the other ones when I could be. Um, you know, like I said, volunteering, doing things. I was chairman of the Outer Banks um, Home Builder Association, president of that. You know, president of the Remodeling Council you know, education foundation, parks and recs. I mean, you name it, pretty much everything. I had my hands in it. I was, I was involved in it on the board. Uh, fortunately, I had a team that I could delegate administrative tasks to, especially that, you know, office manager, administrative assistant that I tell everybody they need. That's your first key person you need to just take care of everything for you so you can be the visionary and the leader. But the key is I was home every dinner for night, you know, every night, every night for dinner. I had, I took weekends off. I traveled. Uh, you know, four weeks a year, took vacations four weeks a year. I was there for all of my kids' activities. I did not miss a thing. A performance at school, a parent-teacher meeting, an open house, a show and tell, a parent, whatever it was, I did not miss one thing for my kids. I was there for their entire, you know, uh, years that they grew up and were in school. And, you know, all of that while I was building, you know, those companies, it was, you know, I had the most time on my hands. I had, you know, I owned my schedule. I could do whatever I want, wherever I wanted, whenever I wanted, because I was a leader, delegator, motivator. And that's what I teach people how to do is to become the kind of individual that can run multiple companies, you know, or even one company at scale to where you can do anything from anywhere and you don't have to be anywhere at any given time. And I know there's a lot of medical professionals on here and it's a little different business model there, but your profession right now, your practice right now, whether it's medical, dental, whatever it is, you know, that is your business that generates cash flow for you to invest in other assets so that you can grow and scale the businesses that you're investing in aside from medical. And you can scale that too, rolling up and doing different things, a little easier on the dental side than the medical side, but there are opportunities to scale that. But ultimately, your practice is your business for you to generate cash flow to invest in these other assets like Nick and Elaine are doing. So one day you can step away and you can manage your you know, family office and your holdings. And you can do that anywhere in the world from anywhere in the world. And you don't have to be any one place. So that's my long story short. It's been a journey since 1997. And like you said, I'm still active, still you know, doing deals, you know, still on the boards of several companies, you know, co-founder in a tech startup, you know, just a lot of different things. I mean, I just, I'd love to stay busy, stay active and do deals. And yeah, I'm always on the road, but it is. When was the last it's, time it's, you, uh, you walked? It's 9 p.m. A... Eastern time where I'm at right now. So <laughs> not on the road tonight. No, um, I came up with like a ton of questions. I'm going to try to stick to my list because I know lots of other people want to to get coaching from you as well. Um, there was a request for those books. Do you mind sharing with me real quick what the books were that you share with your students? Yeah, yeah. So the One Minute Manager series of books. So that was my management leadership system that we learned and that I employed in all my companies and that I pass along to all of my mentees. So the first book is the new One Minute Manager. It's the updated version of the One Minute Manager, Ken Blanchard and Spencer Johnson, I think. Um, so the new one minute manager. So you read that first. The second book is putting the one minute manager to work. And the third book is leadership and the one minute manager. So go through those one at a time. And what you want to do is read those books and put them into practice. Uh, read the first one, put it into practice. Read the second, put it into practice. Read the third, put it into practice. The first one is the basic understanding of the system in and of itself, you know, help you, you want to help people feel good about themselves. So they'll produce good results in a sincere way, not a manipulative way. Uh, you know, it's all about um, recognizing good performance, setting smart goals, holding people accountable, the behavior. So you always hold the behavior accountable, not the person praise in public, reprimand in private, redirect and reset goals. That's what that first book's all about. The second book teaches you how to put it more in practice. The third book is, you know, more about leadership and situational leadership and how to get the most out of different types of people. Um, so those are the first three fundamental books uh, that I have everybody read. And then, of course, you know, some of the other ones are um, for me, if you haven't read it, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And what's interesting about Rich Dad, Poor Dad, a lot of people read that book and they get real estate out of that book. They want to be Robert Kiyosaki and Kim and they want to, you know, buy real estate and do that. When I, when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, what I got out of the book was I wanted to be Rich Dad. 
because everybody was coming to him with the deals, with the opportunities. He was mentoring people. He was managing things. He wasn't doing any one thing. He was managing all of these things. So that's what I got, got out of that was everybody was going to him. So he was the guy that had the gold, right? That's who I wanted to be. So that's what I did. I went out and built businesses that generate cash flow to invest in other assets. And then I got into the real estate, you know, through the construction business that I had. Uh, the other ones are obviously how to win friends, influence people, valuable, valuable book on communications. Um, you want to read uh, Power of Positive Thinking, Norman Vincent Peale, uh, Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill. These are the basic fundamental foundational books that 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 I am and that I became that I was able to do things because you have to be able to see it and believe it in order to achieve it, Napoleon Hill. Um, and that's real. And those, you know, as you put this stuff in you and it, it, you know, it comes out through you and what you do. And then as far as, you know, multiple companies and leading teams, you know, regionally and globally and around the world, um, managing by Harold Janine, that's a very difficult book to find. He was the CEO of ITT. But if you can get your hands on a copy of that, Managing by Harold Janine, there's some stuff on YouTube and videos with him uh, as far as leadership and management. He was phenomenal. Uh, High Output Management by Andrew Grove. Um, that, that was the Intel CEO, and that's all about systems and things like that. That's a really good book. Um, so those are some really you know fundamental foundational books that you really want to get your hands on. And pretty much every management system out there today, like Traction, EOS, you know, all of those things, they all go back to the one-minute manager. You know, and it's all about people. What traction and EOS, they miss the human component. They're more about systems and procedures and processes. But the one minute manager is about people first because people are your most valuable resource. They're the most important aspect of your business. So you got to get the most out of your people before they'll even be able to take advantage of the systems. And you need to know where to put the people. You got to have the right people in the right seats. So in addition to all that, if you're leading a team, the other most important thing you need to do is personality profiling. And we use the DISC system, D-I-S-C. And you can get free personality profiles online for DISC. But what you wanna do is, you wanna have everybody in your organization take that personality profile, including yourself, and then you wanna share it with everybody so everybody knows what everybody per what everybody else's personality um, characteristics, primary characteristics are, so you know how to interact with them. You know how to approach them. You know how to lead them manage them because everybody's different. Everybody's got a little bit of everything in them. But once you know what somebody's predominant, you know, personality profile looks like, then you know how to approach them. You know how to get the best results out of them. But most importantly, you know what role they need to be fulfilling in your company. And the biggest mistake most leaders make in business, any business, whether you're leading a deal in real estate and it's a construction program uh, or a construction uh, project, or it's a, you know, value add acquisition or whatever it is, you got to lead people. You have to lead that transaction. You're leading the realtors. You're leading the mortgage brokers. You're leading the attorneys. You're leading the inspector. You're leading everybody in that transaction or that deal. So you want to make sure you understand the different types of personalities. And once you take it yourself and your team, you can spot it in other people. So you know how to approach people and lead them in the best way and put the right people in the right seats. And that's the biggest mistake a lot of people make is they put the wrong people in the wrong seat and try to get results out of them and the system fails. They don't know why and everybody gets frustrated. So anyways, that's... that's. <laughs> I remember when we were having some very serious troubles on our construction side of our townhome community. And that's that's you know, basically the coaching you gave us of, you know, you guys are the ones that have to go out and, and lead everyone. And it sounds so simple, but in practice, you know, we were like, well, we hired a builder. We hired you know, this and that, like, aren't they supposed to be doing it? And you were like, no, you lead the team, you know, and the team does it. And it, it totally pivoted things. There was, there was a time in phase two when that project was a little hairy for a while. And now phase three is just, you know, doing so well. And in fact, way better than we, you know, even would have anticipated. So yeah, I remember that, that question coaching. from, uh, I remember that question from Nick, he said, shouldn't yep. the builder know this already? I'm like, well, you know, the builder knows how to build, but he doesn't know what you want. So you mm -hmm. have to give clear direction and no uncertain terms, exactly what's expected and when. I need this done by Friday um, in order to get something done and make something happen versus, yeah, this is what I want. I need this by Friday. Uh, the other thing is clear directions, specifications. The biggest issue were, you know, these types of door locks and things installed certain ways and the baseboard looking and paint colors and all that. So you got to have, you know, clear direction, clear specifications and, uh, you know, what you expect and when so that, they know where they what they expect 
And then you can provide the feedback and they know where they stand. And that's the most important thing. People need to know what you expect and they need to know where they stand. And unless you have a clear goal with specific you know, direction and no uncertain terms, you can't measure that performance. And if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So, you know, that that's the fundamental thing. A lot of people don't think about it. They just say, yeah, go build me a building. And they don't think about it. And then they walk in, they're like, well, this isn't what I wanted. Well, what did you ask for? So mm -hmm. we are the leaders in every situation. It could be your household, your organization, the job site, the project, the deal. You have to lead that team, that transaction, that opportunity, that venture, whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to hear a little bit. It, my question I wrote was, um, how did you survive 2008? But in your introduction, you talked about how you've been through several of these cycles. So why don't we make that question even more expansive and you know, maybe hit on um, how have you survived market downturns and made the most amount of opportunity during that time without getting sucked into the negative mindset and maybe analysis paralysis or hysteria or whatever that maybe others did during those times? Yeah. So the biggest thing in 2008 and 9, I didn't even know that what happened could happen. Had no idea. So the things that I learned there were, and I knew ahead of time. So I had non-recourse debt on all of my projects and I pulled all of my equity out as soon as possible. So I had no equity at stake and I had no debt that was guaranteed. And I owed the bank a lot of money. So, you know, if you owe the bank a million dollars, you know, you know, the old saying, if you owe the bank a million dollars, you can't sleep at night. If you owe them a hundred million, you sleep like a baby. The more you owe, the more they are in bed with you and they're your partner, especially if you have no equity at stake. So as the builder developer, I always pulled my equity out uh, on the front end, either through fees or through a quick cash out refinance. And then I would let the project roll from there. So what was really eye opening about 0809 was how quick the real estate market could change. The real estate market is a slow moving thing, but it can change quick in some aspects. So values can take a little while to kind of catch up in the retail market. But when financing and, you know, so it was low interest rates, it was the cost of the debt, it was the availability of that debt, you know, is what drove and what drives a real estate market. And I knew that all along. Uh, as interest rates rise, values drop. As interest rates drop, values rise. So that's just the way it is. And it's also the availability of debt. So if you have low interest rates or zero interest rates, but you can't get the debt, it doesn't make any difference. So uh, the key is, is to understand that rates can change really fast, which can change the debt markets and credit markets really fast, which can change the ability to finance projects really fast, which can ultimately then change the values of real estate in some aspects very fast and other aspects, you know, very slow. If sellers don't have to sell, they can be very slow to kind of come around. But if you're trying to buy something, you know, in the banks and you're dealing with banks, you know, that kind of stuff happens very quick. The other thing is, what I learned through that process is as soon as you close a loan, you're in technical default. So a bank can call your loan pretty much anytime. There's all kinds of little fine print in there. If you read it, they can put you in technical default the minute you close. Um, it's not always in their best interest to do it, but during 2008 and 9, they did that. They called loans, they called you in technical default, and they started closing and foreclosing on loans and taking properties back at scale. Now that whole environment has changed. So, you know, that's, and, you know, so in that environment, when things were changing, my construction business went out of business. We had no no work. So we shut down the construction company. So I had to pivot and recreate myself. And I started doing some other things. But I had lots of properties with good cash flow, with no risk, I had no equity on the line. It was all non-recourse debt, you know, and I had a good chunk of change in the bank. So that's how I made it through 2008 and 9. But I had two of my mentors back then were each billionaires. They were two of the largest developers in the Hampton Roads area two brothers, each worked over a billion each, each had their own golf stream. They got wiped out, wiped out because they put up all the equity and they guaranteed the debt. And, you know, I remember one of them, you know, telling me a story that literally he watched the guy in the bank push a button and $300 million got sucked out of his account, um, you know, to cover interest on some of his projects. So, you know, interest rates and debt can kill you if it's, you know, if you don't plan for the worst. And that's how you and I and Nick, you know, managed over that, you know, pandemic period as rates were going up so high. And, you know, you were looking at these deals. And what I kept telling you was these rates are not going to come down as fast as everybody thinks. You need to plan that these rates are going to go higher and they're going to stay higher. And uh, what I also learned is that different feds, right? So back in the Greenspan days, 0809, he, he would surprise the markets and he would not telegraph his moves. What's mm -hmm. really cool about Jay Powell over the last, you know, his term in office, like four or five years, how long have he's, he's been there? I guess he goes back to maybe Trump. Um, well, he was after, yeah, I can't remember. No, I guess there was yelling them anyways. 
Powell's been chairman of the Fed for at least four years. So he is very good at communicating what they're going to do. So he's not mm -hmm. going to surprise you. So all you have to do is watch the Fed. Don't watch the markets. Don't watch what the pundits and all that say. Watch what Jerome Powell says. If he says we're raising rates, they're raising rates. If he says we're not, they're not. Um, so, you know, they're very easy to understand in terms of guidance and where we're going. And I think the biggest thing that's caught a lot of people off guard this go around was they thought rates were going to come down. They thought that these higher rates were temporary. They thought inflation was temporary. And, you know, they, you know, a lot of people just weren't looking at the real signs. Inflation is coming down, but it's kind of sticky and stubborn. Whether or not 3% is a real number or should be a real number or 2% doesn't matter. You just got to watch what the Fed is doing and what they're telegraphing. And, you know, that way you can kind of ant anticipate where rates are going. And, you know, the biggest thing I told you guys was, you know, make sure you have cash flow. Make sure you plan on your rents potentially flatlining or even coming down. Make sure you plan on rates staying up higher. And, you know, make sure that you don't have short-term bridge debt that you can't refinance. That's where mm -hmm. a lot of people are caught right now. And there's, I don't know, there's... um. $90 billion worth of multifamily loans alone that are coming due um, in a short term or that are in foreclosure right now. There's four or 500 billion coming due this year, commercial real estate. So, you know, there's a lot of distressed real estate out there and it's going to be a lot of opportunities coming around. So, you know, these are the ways that you navigate and, and manage these markets and just understand it's mm -hmm. peaks and valleys. Good times never last, bad times never last. So you got to prepare for the bad times and enjoy the good times. Absolutely. I have spent more time psychoanalyzing Jerome Powell than any other human in the world. And I've never had the opportunity to meet him, but I know that the way he thinks it impacts my business directly. And exactly like you said, he, he is not a secretive person. He, he puts out what he thinks he does speak a little bit in poetry. So I find that I have to read his press releases slowly because every word matters. He doesn't just say, I'm raising interest rates next month, or I plan to lower interest rates in three months. There's a little more poeticness to it. Um, I put a, a good um, a good PDF in the, the chat there. It's about three months old now. It's the summary of economic projections from the Federal Reserve. Something that I follow is what's called the dot plot, which is basically the Fed has governors that are the voting members, and that's who decides to raise or lower interest rates. And the dot plot is each of those governors having a dot telling you where they expect interest rates to be over 2023, 2024, 2025, 2026, and beyond. So the data is there. And just just listen to what Jerome says. And Greg, you've been giving us that you know guidance for years, and we've followed it. And I think we're in a really safe position with our debt because we got all fixed rate debt, knowing that that rates you know would be going up. What um you kind of at the at the end there you you know kind of dovetailed right into the next question I have there of, of you know the market has changed a lot in the last eighteen to twenty four months because of the drastic increase in interest rates and the bridge loans that are out there and the debt that's coming due I think banks are doing a lot of workouts with borrowers right now to because banks don't want to own real estate the way they did in two thousand eight I think they learned in two thousand eight hey we're bankers not real estate investors. But what do you think is going to happen in the next, say, six to 12 months in the real estate market? But let's let's maybe focus on residential real estate. Yeah. So residential is very different. And, you know, they are actually bringing back um, the pandemic forbearance programs. So for anybody that's in residential and they're in trouble, all you got to do is call your lender and say, hey, you know, I can't make my payments. And you don't even have to show, um, you know, any anything. You just have to you just got to tell them and they'll, you know, They'll rework your loan, make it turn it into a 40 year loan, 35 year loan, give you, you know, six, 12 months, put that to the back of the loan. So the residential side, they're very accommodated now. The banks and lenders are uh, versus, you know, the way they used to be. You used to have to show a hardship and send them all kinds of financial information to even get the conversation going. You don't have to do that anymore. All you got to do is say, look, I can't make the payments and they'll automatically do that. Car loans are doing the same thing. So there's still a little bit of that out there. But as far as the residential market, Hyper local real estate's hyper local. Every city's different. Every neighborhood in every city is different. Every position you know on that street is different in every neighborhood. So you know, understand what what I'm talking about in the context of real estate in the in the residential housing market. It's very hyper local. Commercial is too, but not not as much. It, it can be, but residential specifically. So you still have an inventory problem in most areas of the country. There's some areas where inventory is stacking up. You know, out in Arizona and you know Nevada, some areas of Florida. Um, where we're seeing some, you know, some inventory start to climb Austin, Texas, 
um, things like that. Uh, you know, but in most areas, there still is, is no inventory and builders can't build fast enough because they can't get enough labor. Um, you know, there's still some su supply constraints and the labor is, has been an issue from 08, 09. A lot of people left the industry in 08, 09, and we haven't had a lot of new people coming in to kind of take over. Uh, and there's a lot of people retiring from the trades here in the next five to 10 years. There's nobody coming up behind them. So it's going to get worse. So we really need to bring labor in to ramp up production. We just don't have the people. That's why costs are so high right now. That's why it takes so long. And, you know, that's why we can't build our way out of this. I mean, it'd take 10 years right now at capacity to build our way out of our inventory problem. So, you know, you're still seeing a really, you know, hot real estate market. Yes, prices are coming down in some areas because of interest rates, but they're coming down off of highly distorted levels. So we had three years of appreciation uh, or 10 years of appreciation in three years when the pandemic hit in real estate going on four years now. So what, what I see happening in residential real estate is prices have kind of leveled off in most areas. Again, very hyper-local. But in general, if you look at the average across the country, prices are leveling off and incomes are going to just, you know, over the next seven years, kind of catch up to these prices. So I don't see prices coming down anytime soon because the market is still healthy. Most of the loans, 80% of the loans are, are long-term fixed rate debt on, on um, residential mortgages. Most of them are under 4%. Most of them are good borrowers, put good down payments. There's very few foreclosures. There's very little distress. And there's lots of programs out there for forbearance. And most markets are hot where people can sell. You know, um, you hear about the Airbnb bust where that's just going to be the next. You've heard all these things are going to tank the housing market. There's not enough inventory in Airbnb to tank the housing market. You hear this 1 million homes. That's 1 million units. It could be a hotel room, could be a trailer, could be a bedroom, could be an apartment. You know, these aren't homes. You know, there's probably really 500,000 homes in, in between Airbnb, VRBO, and vacation rentals. And when you take those, probably more than half of those are in vacation destination markets like I started in the Outer Banks of North Carolina, where most of those houses were vacation rentals. They're not, you know, that's not something that's going to affect a year-round housing market at, at scale like in Austin, Texas. That's one of the problems in Austin, Texas is, you know, everybody turned anything into an Airbnb during the pandemic. Now there's no renters for them, so they're you know cash flow negative and they're selling them. The other thing that's really happened in the residential market and commercial, uh, taxes have gone up significantly. Insurance has you know quadrupled in some areas or more, doubled in most areas, um, and just your operating costs you know to manage a property and to own a property have gone up. You know your cost of maintenance, whether it's labor, materials, uh, utilities, things like that. So you know that's put a lot of rental properties in the red and in the negative. You know, so that's kind of what what's happening with the housing market. There is no crash coming in the housing market. There isn't enough inventory to crash the housing market. So all you have to watch inventory levels. That's really all you got to watch um, is inventory levels. And again, every market's different. Some some are correcting more heavily than others, but we still haven't seen prices come down to pre pandemic levels. Uh, mm -hmm. Until you see that, you're not in a housing you know situation like we saw in 0809, where you know prices were just you know values were dropping fifty percent. Um, you know, from where they were two or three years prior. Absolutely. Next up, I have four questions. So basically the question is, what advice would you give to someone? And then I have that persona. And I think based on the four kind of personas that I have here, that probably will cover everyone on the call. Um, so what advice would you give to someone specifically who is just starting out in their real estate journey? So, um, you know, what I always tell people for the first time is, you know, just get a deal done. So find something because there's like you said, there's this analysis paralysis, right? There's so many things you can do. There's so many different types. And that's the biggest thing I get from people is what should I do? Do a deal. So whatever you're comfortable with, whatever you understand the most and whatever you feel the most drawn to, whether that's a residential like you started with single family homes or it could be a you know duplex, quadruplex. It could be a multifamily. Multifamily is five units and up four units and down is residential attached. Um, uh, but, you know, or it could be commercial, it could be medical office, could be retail, could be self-storage, could be car washes. Just find something and become an expert at it. Not only the asset, but the area. So you need to become an expert. You need to develop your buy box. You need to develop, you know, the region that you want to do business in. You need to be an expert in that region. So whatever you're looking at, the asset type, um, you need to understand, you know, how many are on the market at any given time, how much do they sell for, how many are in a contract, what was the asking price, and um, you know, what, what when they sell when they sold, what was the sale price versus you know list price. So you really need to know that 
and understand that and recite that in your markets without having to look at anything. And you know, the way you learn it is by looking, obviously. You need to know what the incomes are, what the rents are, what the expense ratios are, what the expenses are, all the different little nuances, the regulatory environment permits, you know, anything and everything you need to know around that asset, you have to become an expert. It takes three things to do real estate deals. One, you need deals. Two, you need expertise. Three, you need the capital. You don't need all three, but you got to have at least one of those three. And the best thing to have is the expertise because you can find the other two when you have the expertise. If you got the expertise, you can find deals and you can find capital, right? Or if you've got capital, uh, then you can find, you know, people that are experts and you can invest in their deals like Nick and Elaine. So uh, the other thing is, if you think about real estate in terms of where you live and where you are, your geography, if you want to be, you know, narrow in your type of asset, you got to be broad in your geography, right? So if you want to just focus on, you know, 200 unit multifamily, you know, class, you know, B and C value add, well, there's only going to be so many of those in your area. So you got to broaden your geography, right? But if you want to be narrowly focused in your geography, like I was, then you need to broaden your asset type and your strategies. That's why, you know, I started as a builder. So for me, development just was natural. I was a general contractor. I started out doing remodeling, then I started building homes. Then I started building buildings and I started doing subdivisions, like taking big tracts of land and developing them in the subdivision, putting streets, utilities, and all that stuff in. So I've done pretty much every asset type uh, in you know my region, and I didn't want to be traveling all over the place. That's why I did that. So I did ground up, I did value add, I did opportunistic, you know, heavy lift value add type stuff. Um, I did all kinds of things so I could stay in my region. Uh, so that's kind of how that works. But the key is get comfortable with something and then just do a deal. Just get started. Doesn't matter what it is. Just do a deal to get started uh, or invest in somebody else's deal so you can kind of learn that way as well. So if you don't have the, you know, if you don't want to do your own deals and start investing with other people and uh, you can, you can learn that way until you get to the point to where you're ready to do your own deals. That's awesome. The next persona I have is that same question. So what advice would you give to someone specifically who already has a portfolio and they want to scale their own portfolio actively. So okay. they don't want to be a GP. They don't want to be an LP. They specifically want to grow their own holdings. What advice would you give them? Right. So, you know, in order to scale, you know, you need two things. You need the team and you need the capital. So what you want to do is focus on the team first because you need that team with systems and processes in place so you can raise the capital. In order to scale, you need deals and you need capital. So you need that team to help you find deals and help you find capital. So the first thing you need to do is you need to write down, take an inventory of where you are right now. So where are you right now? What does your team look like? What does your company look like? What does your portfolio look like? Take an honest inventory of where that is. Then you need to write down where you want to take it and make it a big goal, okay? And then reverse engineer that goal. But in order to get to that big goal, you need to think about, okay, what do I need to look like as an entrepreneur? to get to that level. Who do I need to become? Then you need to think about who do I need to surround myself with? You're gonna need a team in order to scale. And that team can be um, you know, outsourced or you can hire that. Uh, the number one thing you need, every entrepreneur needs when they're scaling is you gotta have that administrative uh, you know, office manager slash administrative assistant slash marketing assistant slash slash slash. You need somebody that you can say, hey, I've got a Zoom at 8.30, I've got Greg coming on, we got 80 people, 88 people, set this thing up, get it running, here's the slides, let me know when you're ready. You know, so you need to be that leader, that delegator, that motivator. So you need that key person that can handle all of the little details for you. And then as you go along, well, you're gonna need somebody sourcing deals. So you need an you know, acquisitions manager, you're gonna need somebody dealing with investors, so you're gonna need you know, an investment you know, manager, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, director of an, of an uh, um, investor relations. That's what you need. You need somebody to manage the investor relations. Uh, and then you're going to need, you know, somebody well, managing the assets. What if specifically in, in, with this particular persona, they don't want to raise capital? They just want to build a portfolio with, say, them and their spouse. Okay. So I have a know, persona who wants to build as a GP, but specifically folks that yeah, say, I just want to grow flow, my own family's like, yeah. wealth. Yeah. So again, you still need a team to help you do that because you got to source deals. So if you don't need to raise the capital, you got to get the financing. So you need the banking relationships. Um, you need capital. So you need to be generating cash flow to invest. So I'm going to assume this person has the income and they just want to place it. So really at that point, it's all, it comes down to good deals, right? You need to be able to find good deals. So you either have to spend your time, you and your spouse doing that as a team, or you need to hire somebody to help you source good deals. 
you can leverage realtors in the market. That that business is going to be changing here real soon in the residential side, commercial commercial side. You know, you, you've always paid your own brokers anyway, so that's kind of a normal thing. Um, versus residential, people are going to have to start paying their own buyers brokers to help find deals. But you can you can work with wholesalers, you can work with uh, other investors, you know. But you need a good deal flow. And uh, you know, Peter and Anania is on here. You know, he's building a nice business just by being a deal finder. So he connected with Simon. You know, Simon said, hey, go find a deal and we'll do it. Well, Peter went out there and got to work. So there's people like Peter out there looking for deals all day long um, that can bring you deals. There's realtors out there. So really, it's going to boil down to deal flow. And then you're going to need you know, a team to execute on it. Um, you know, so that, that's really what that comes down to in terms of scaling. But really, the key is, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Um, you, know, you want to you know, hire out and outsource your weaknesses and focus on your strengths. So whatever your strengths are, Focus 100% on that and hire out, delegate out, outsource everything else that, you know, is not the best use, highest and best use of your time. So that's really the biggest thing is you need to figure out what is it that you need to be doing. You know, the whole 80-20 rule, you know, 80% of your results come from 20% of your efforts. Take that 20% and break that down into 100%. Okay. In that 20%, 100% of your results are going to come from one or two things that you're doing. So focus on those one or two things. Delegate outsource, hire out everything else and stay focused. So that's that's really what it's going to take. And again, depending on your geography, if you want to scale, you may have to, you know, broaden your geography or broaden your asset type. Awesome. So such such good advice. I have two more personas here and then we can open the floor to what I call like flask coaching. So if you have a question um, that you'd like to um, ask of Greg, um, go ahead and raise your hand so that we can kind of get some sense of how many of those questions might be out there. And then we'll ask these couple of questions and then we'll open the floor for all of you to get some coaching tonight. So with these personas, so what advice would you give specifically to someone who wants to scale actively as a general partner? Actively as a general partner. So how's that different than the previous? That they want to raise capital. Okay. Or the, so, the, yeah. the other one wanted to just place their own family's capital. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, if you want to raise capital, then again, that goes back to, you know, um, if you're not the one to lead that charge, you need to find somebody because you need a system. Uh, you need an investor management, investor relations system. Uh, and then, you know, eventually you're going to need somebody to kind of run that and manage that and be in charge of investor relations. Uh, you're going to need somebody on the asset management side. You're going to see, need somebody on the acquisition side as you scale. But again, you need to understand what your strengths are and you have to be out there doing it. You got to get in front of people uh, and you have to promote the opportunity that you have for people to invest. People are looking for good deals to invest in. There's a lot of capital out there. I mean, there's $7 trillion on the sidelines and money markets and all that stuff out there right now, just waiting, waiting to go into the markets, waiting to go into real estate deals. Um, so you have to become good at, you know, it's a contact sport. So you have to cast a wide net. You have to talk to a lot of people. The best way to do it is like this. You want to talk to people you know, one to many, um, you know, as little one-on-one -on -one as you can, one to many doing investor webinars and things like that. And you need a system and a funnel. So you need to be able to, you know, as you're rolling along and you're really scaling, you want to get into where you're running paid ads to drive people into your funnel uh, and organic content where you're driving people into your funnel. So you want to become a thought leader in your space, or you have to bring somebody on who's in charge of investor relations, business development, that can go out and do that for you, can, can, can attend conferences, do webinars, be online, be the face, be the personality. And that's a big component. It's a constant, constant thing. You need to always be raising. Whether you have a deal or not, you need to always be bringing investors into your system so that you can kind of know how much investable capital do you have in your pipeline at any given time so that when you have a deal, you know, you, you know that you can fund it. Very good advice. Thank you for that. And then this is my last persona. What advice would you give to someone specifically who wants to scale as a passive investor? So they don't yeah, want to so do anything active. They just want to place capital passively. Yeah. So, you know, that's going to boil down to the operator. So your choices are you can diversify into multiple operators or you can stick with one or two or you can stick with one. So that's really up to you. But, you know, that's going to be sourcing good operators. And, you know, you want people like Nick and Elaine to have a good long track record that have successful. Well, they don't exit anything. They keep everything. So, you know, that, that's their track record. They don't like to sell. But if you're looking for, you know, the exit, then you need to, you know, make sure that your sponsor that you're investing with, your general partner that you're investing with um, has uh, a good track record of successful exits. They've gone full cycle on multiple deals over preferably at least one business cycle. You know, there's a lot of people that just jumped into the game the last three or four years. 
you preferably you want to be with somebody that made it through 2008 and nine, if you can, or started right in that time frame. Uh, you know, that understand the business cycle. Uh, and then, you know, you can also be a fund of funds. So if you just want to invest passively, you can raise capital and you can be a fund of funds. So you can raise capital from your network. Then you can bring a bigger pile of capital to a deal with a general partner and negotiate a better uh, return for you and your investors. So that's that's one way to scale the business as a limited partner investor if you want to do that. If you don't want to do that and just use your own funds, then it's going to boil down to your operators. And, um, you know, that's going to be really the key. And the more you bring, you know, maybe the better favorable terms you can get sometimes if maybe you need more depreciation. So the, so it's negotiable. Everything's negotiable. You can negotiate more depreciation. You can ne negotiate maybe, you know, a higher return if you bring a lot of money. If you're writing a $10 million check or a $5 million check, you'll, you'll get preferential treatment over somebody who's writing a $100,000 check. All right. Well, hopefully that hit everyone listening. And if I if I didn't get you in one of those four personas, so that was someone starting out, someone scaling actively with their own portfolio, someone scaling actively as a general partner, i.e. raising capital, and someone scaling with passive investments. If I didn't, if you don't feel like you were represented there and you have a question for Greg, this is your chance to raise your hands. So we have a couple of folks that have raised their hand. Please, if you would like to have coaching tonight, raise your hand now so we can get some sense of how we can time out um, the folks that we work with. I did have one question that was submitted in advance, so I'll start with that. Um, the question was, and you kind of alluded to it when you chuckled, of uh, the real estate industry is really changing with buyer brokers. So first, could you give just like a two or three minute synopsis of what that is for folks that maybe aren't aware of the rulings that have happened over the last several weeks in residential real estate? Um, and then tell us how you think that's going to change things over the next, say, six to 12 months. Yeah. So there's there was, uh, you know, several class action lawsuits against the National Association of Realtors and some large real estate brokerages about uh, antitrust forcing uh, sellers to pay the buyer's agent commission. So that's really the bulk of, uh, you know, the brunt of what this lawsuit was about. So the National Association of Realtors now has realized they're not going to win. So they've settled for four hundred twenty million dollars or something like that. And, you know, there's some conditions in this settlement where um, they are no longer going to be able to um, require the sellers to pay the buyer's agent. So buyer's agents now are going to have to be compensated out of pocket by the buyer. Again, that happens a lot in commercial anyways, but in residential real estate, that's going to be a big problem for buyer's agents because usually the commission is paid by the seller. It's all part of the deal. Um, does it come from the buyer since they're getting a loan? Does it come from the seller? It's in the loan at the end of the day. So the buyer doesn't feel it out of their pocket. The seller feels it more than the buyer does. So now uh, that's one. The other one is commissions um, have to be negotiable and it has to be in writing. So you, so now you have to have a written agreement from a buyer's agent before you can work with them and what they're going to get compensated for. And you have to compensate them as a buyer out of your pocket. The second thing is sellers uh, no longer, um, well, the, the commission now has to be mandatory negotiable. So they have to disclose that their commission is negotiable. Whereas before, people were being led to believe that commissions were not negotiable and that there was a standard 6% in the industry for residential real estate and land, you know, lots would go for 10%, uh, regardless of the price of the house. So now I think what you're going to see as we go forward is I think you're going to see flat fees. I think you're going to see potentially hourly, especially on the buyer's agent side, or you're going to see title companies and real estate attorneys kind of get involved for the buyer versus agents. Uh, so I think that's going to be a very difficult thing. I think you're still going to see sellers wanting to work with real estate agents to list in the MLS. And I think that's the next big shooter drop right now. A lot of local associations require membership with the national association of realtors in order to be part of the MLS. You have to join the local associations board and you have to be a member of uh, the national association of realtors. So that may go away. So I think ultimately the national association of realtors is losing a lot of ground here um, in terms of this, this recent settlement. So it'll be interesting to see what actually happens, but those are the biggest changes right now is that commissions, once the public gets ed educated from the seller side, that 3% is going to be negotiable. Uh, they're going to have to disclose all this up front. Buyers are going to have to pay agents out of their pocket. So I think that that business model might, might go away altogether. Uh, you might see more dual agency or you might see other people just doing you know, negotiation for a fee or hourly, you know, kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big, big changes in the real estate industry just over the last you know, days, even and and weeks. Very curious to see how it 
um, how it unfolds. I suspect that my, my prediction is that um, home buyers will be unable to marshal a down payment and the cost of their broker. So it will be added into the closing costs and lenders will become comfortable with, you know, including that in the closing costs. It's going to take time for all of this to trickle through all of the real estate markets in all of the country and lending and appraisal. Like there's, you know, many different players involved in all of this, but that's something that I think might happen over the next six to 12 months. All right. looks like we have Scott and then Andy. Um, and then I can't see the name and then Brian. So Scott, why don't we go ahead and get started? How are you tonight? Doing well. Thanks, Elaine. And uh, thank you, Elaine, for setting this up and Greg for taking the time. It's been yeah. very helpful so far. Who do you have there with you? Uh, this is my wife, Katie. Hi, Katie. <laughs> nice to meet you all. Yeah. So um, thanks for taking the question. So my question relates to timing of buying and selling, where we are in the market cycle. And it's great to ask it of someone who's been through multiple cycles. Um, and so I'd like to know kind of where you think we are specifically within, you know, those four phases of the uh, of the market cycle and when you think is going to be the best opportunity to buy. And I know that people say, you know, you can buy at any point in the in the market cycle. But in my mind, when prices are higher, interest rates are higher, it introduces more risk. And so I kind of wonder, like, are there certain asset classes that have a better risk adjusted return, you know, when prices are high and rates are higher or, you know, sort of what ways to start or what indicators maybe to look at to say, like, if the 10 year yield falls below or above this point, that's a great time to kind of pull the trigger. So what are your thoughts on those things? Yeah, so it's all going to depend on obviously your area, the type of asset, what you're looking for. If it comes to income property, you can pay whatever you want. Doesn't matter. So it all you got you got to start with your goals and start with the end in mind. Whether it's a business or real estate deal, whatever it is, always start with the end in mind. And if the if the property cash flows and returns on your equity that satisfies you, whatever return you're looking for, then the deal works. So and it could even be negative if you think you're going to get appreciation or if you think you know that you have you know your multiple exit strategies could be a sale, could be a refinance, could be a repositioning. So it really depends on your goals. But, you know, overall, in general, uh, you know, the housing market, again, that's going to be, you know, depends on the area. But we are at not normal levels of interest rates. I mean, 5% is a good interest rate. You know, I did most of the bulk of my business, you know, when I was really going at it, we were, the interest rates were 7 to 9%. So, you know, 5% is a good, good interest rate. The key to watch is real estate is still in the expansion phase because we have very little inventory. So we're still in the expansion phase. Prices are still remaining higher. Um, because there's there's constraints on you know residential inventory as far as office goes um, you know standard office buildings are taking the biggest hit especially in a lot of the bigger cities you know I mean in the in the you know work from home model that we have now like we're doing tonight um, you know there's less demand for office so you're seeing office really go at big discounts big discounts stuff that people paid 300 million dollars for let you know even three or four years ago are paying 50 to 100 million now um, we're seeing hospitality. So uh, hotels are trading uh, a lot lower than they were three or four or five years ago because of interest rates. Those are the best cash flows, by the way. But that's that's a business. You know, hotels are that's a that's a you know hospitality business. It's a retail business within real estate. But that's that's your highest cash flowing type of real estate. Um, probably next to that would be car washes, um, and then you know self storage does pretty good, but it's hard to scale. You need a lot of units, but those are more profitable than you know. Multifamily, the, the attraction to multifamily is that it's easier to finance, you can do bigger deals and you can scale it. Um, but those are going to be a lot of times your least profitable now because of the inflation that we've seen and the compression that we saw in cap rates over the last few years. And, you know, that's the stickiest segment of the market right now. Those cap rates aren't aren't uh, changing the values as much as we thought. It's changing it a little bit. And there's a lot of distress and a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stress in that multifamily market. But you know, there's a lot of sellers out there that are still hanging on to those 2000, uh, you know, 21, 2000, you know, 20, 21, 22, when rates were two and a half, three percent, you know, value. So medical is really good. Medical office, dental office, uh, you know, veterinary offices. Those are really good assets to own. Um, you know, some retail strips are coming back in some areas. So those are good assets to own. But again, your highest cash flows are going to be a lot of times are going to be, um, you know, hotels definitely self-storage and um, car washes are really good. 
Any follow-up questions you have, Scott or Katie? Uh, not on mine. That was great. Thank you. How about you? I don't either. Thank you. That was awesome. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thanks for getting us started. Andy and Jenny? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, Greg, thank you for your time. You're, you have some great information. So I was hoping you might be able to give us some perspective of all the years you've done real estate. So Jenny and I have done real estate for the last probably five years together, maybe a little longer than that. And we both were really, really passionate about it when we first started out. And what I found like is I would find these projects or these deals that just really excited me. And I would commit myself to be the admin person, like the team that you talked about. And so as you know, deals have changed and the market has changed, I've shifted my focus elsewhere with different, you know, my business and different things. But uh, I've kind of left Jenny sitting here still excited and eager to do deals, but we don't have the admin team to like make it happen anymore. So who would like, how would you staff that team? Is that like VAs from across the world or, you know, is there institutions we can go to and hire people who could help do that work that I used to do, but now I, my time is spent, is spent elsewhere. Yeah. Are you guys doing primarily residential or commercial? We have a mix of residential and commercial. Jenny has a, a commercial medical and we have a short-term rental. We just basically like a grab bag of everything. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's a couple options. One, uh, if somebody will put this in the chat, um, Bullpen RE. So Bullpen RE is a commercial real estate outsourcing, um, you know, analyst type company. So they 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 help you by placing people if you're looking for employees. They have a job placement kind of thing, but they also have outsourcing. So very sophisticated. Some of them are high level. Um, so it depends on what you're looking for and they'll do piecework, you know, either by the hour, by the project or by the month. So they're, you know, but they're sophisticated and you have different types, you know, asset managers, um, investor relations, people, uh, analysts, you know, like for underwriting and things like that acquisitions, so they've got, you know, all the different people, it, it, you know, some of them are really high level and expensive. And then on the lower end, there's real estate VA. So like literally if you need transaction coordination and things like that. Um, you know, you can offload a lot of that onto your title company or real estate closing attorney, whoever you use there, because they have an office and paralegals. But, you know, the day to day stuff, you can hire, uh, you know, real estate transaction coordinators or real estate VAs. So there are people in the states as well as outside the states. If you just Google real estate VAs in your market, you know, you'll see stuff come up where you can hire virtual assistants that are focused pretty much on real estate. And I will start networking with realtors because there's gonna be a lot of realtors looking for jobs and part time work here real soon. So, uh, you know, uh, stay in touch with your local realtors association and let them know that you're looking for people, you know, part time to help you in your real estate business and leverage agents. You know, the agents will do a lot of this for you, commercial and residential, but leverage them uh, as well. But, yeah, you, you might be able to find some people looking to make a change here in the real estate industry. Terrific. Thank you very much. Um, Brian, you're up next. Hi there. Thank uh, you, Brian, Andy and Jenny, for your question. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, in McKinney, Texas, the Dallas suburb, thanks to Black Swan for the invite to this. It's been great and very informative. And I find myself after these sessions and after a lot of podcasts I listen to, I just, I get all this energy going and I feel like I've got shiny object syndrome now. I bought so many different, I bought five or six different asset classes. I'm, I'm a passive investor. Um, that's all I've done so far. And I've had some success with it. But now I feel like I'm sitting on some capital. I'm sitting on maybe home equity. I feel like I'm sitting on some things that I could leverage to take the next step. And I want to create income. That's what I want to do next and start to replace the W-2 as I ease out of what I'm doing now. And so, but I just, I'm, my mind's going in a lot of different directions. Maybe I need coaching. Maybe I need some mentoring. I don't know. But what would you tell somebody who, I guess I fit into the persona of the um, wanting to scale as a passive investor but I want to go go beyond the passive investing. So, any yeah, advice? You want to start doing some active stuff. So I think you know, so, and I don't know if I if I want to just because it's it's what I'm most excited about now, or if it because it makes sense for what I want to accomplish. That's what I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that would take a lot of digging into and just looking at your overall financial picture and your goals and all that. But you know, again, the biggest thing to do is to start out with you know where you are now. You know, just write down where you are now, take an honest inventory of your business, where you are now. Also, we didn't talk about investing in businesses, but, you know, I, I a lot of my clients are investing in businesses, too. Those make great passive income investments where you can own a business, have somebody run it for you. I mean, that's what I did. And those are those are great cash flows and 
that's actually to the previous question, some of your highest and best returns are in businesses. A lot of people, you know, think that they have to go to real estate to really build wealth. You can build a lot of wealth in your company or, you know, rolling up types, you know, different types of, of companies, multiple dentist office, medical offices, veterinary clinics, car washes, you know, things like that, laundromats. There's a lot of things that you can roll up to create value and have a big exit, way bigger than you can, you know, with property sometimes, depending on, you know, where you're at. But what I would say is take an inventory of where you are, you know, write down where you want to be, you know, what it is your, what, what is your real goal? So you say you want to do this. And I know what you say, you get off the, these types of things and podcasts, you're like, man, I'm ready to go. And you're like, but what am I ready to go to? So you really got to think about, you know, what is it that you're really looking for? Is it an income number? Is it a lifestyle? You know, uh, what is it that you're really trying to accomplish? Because that's going to be, you know, you're going to be able to nominal, you know, nominalize that and put a number to it. So start with that. Start with that number. Is it, you know, is it a hundred thousand a month? Is it 20,000 a month? Is it $10 million in the bank? You know, what's that number? And then we got to reverse engineer that number. So once you start thinking about what, where am I now? What is it that I'm trying to achieve? And what's the number that I need to achieve that? Then we can reverse engineer it and then put you to work filling in the holes to get you to that number. And number is never net worth. If you get one big takeaway from here tonight, net worth means nothing. The thing that got me through the pandemic, I mean, through uh, 2008, 2009, it wasn't net worth. I had, a, I had a big net worth that went to zero overnight, zero. What got me through was cash flow and cash in the bank, not net worth. So forget your equity. It, it's meaningless when, when things go down. You need cash flow and cash. So put a number to your goal and then we'll reverse engineer it. So can we follow up with you later about, uh, I mean, are you taking on clients in coaching situations? Is that what part of yeah. what this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think Elaine put, put the uh, information in the chat, gregdickerson.com. That's an easy one to remember. Right. Um, but yeah, there's a little application on there. You can fill out, kind of tells me, gives me an idea of where you're at and what your goals are. And then we'll set up a call and, and we'll talk about it. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks for the question, Brian. Jessica, you're next. And then I have a couple of questions that folks have put into chat that I can read out after that. And if anyone else wants to go, please raise your hand so that we can watch our timing. Hi, Jessica. Hi. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? There you are. Yes. Hey, everybody. Elaine, thank you so much for doing this. And Greg, I appreciate you being here. I am sitting here with my husband, Dave. And we own our medical practice. I opened it in 2019. So as I grow that, we're trying to scale the business into multiple locations. Um, and we're not far from you. We're just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And I grew up in Hampton Roads. So that's great. Um, at the same time, we're also scaling our real estate. We have two commercial properties, one that um, is an investment and one in which houses our medical office um, and soon to be another business that we will also own. Um, my question is, how do we scale the two at the same time and in the same sort of I don't want to say linear, but in the same direction, what I want is multiple locations for the medical practice and also to own the real estate in some capacity. So we're trying to figure out kind of what that looks like and how to scale both at the same time. Strategically. So what is your, what type of practice is it? It's a family medicine, med spa, sort of functional practice, all three in one. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So number one, you need great providers, right? In order to scale that. So I've that, got those. <laughs> okay. So, you know, um, and you need to think about, you know, who do you need to become to do this? And are you the person to do it? Because you have the vision and you have, you know, the net worth and those types of things, but you may or may not be the person to lead that charge. So that's what you really have to figure out and dig in deep. Are you, are you a CEO? You know, can you lead that? And if not, that's what you got to find. So you got to bring somebody on that's done what you're looking to do put them in a position of strength and coach them to success. And that's what I do. And that's what I've done with all my companies. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when I built million dollar homes, I've never built a house before. To this day, I do not know how to frame a house. What did I do? I wanted to build million dollar homes. So I went and found um, the vice president of a company that was already doing 60 million a year. That's where I wanted to be. I hired him, brought him on board and I let him do his job and I coached him to success. So, you know, that's, that's what, you know, really you got to think about is, you know, can you be the one to lead the charge? So you have to replace yourself in the day-to-day -day and lead that charge, or 
do you need to find somebody to build it for you? And all of us, once we get to a level, you need to bring somebody in to build it for you and take it over. Every great founder needs to take the back seat and bring in a great CEO. We're not all great CEOs. You know, we're leaders, we're visionaries, we're founders, we're entrepreneurs. We don't always make the best CEOs. You know, so that that's going to be key is finding the right people. And that's that's a tricky process because you really need to spend a lot of time with that person to make sure that you've got the right person because the wrong person can just kill it all. The real estate's the easy part. You know, and that we can build it, we can renovate it, we can, you know, buy it. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can tackle the real estate. The key is, are you in the carry market or where, where are you? We're outside of Charlotte. Outside yeah. of Charlotte. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, Charlotte's a great market and there's a lot of opportunities there. And there's a lot yeah. of, you know, transitional real estate pieces that would probably work well for you. Right. So, you know, you could do that or, uh, and I'm, you know, I don't know what the office market looks like in Charlotte, but probably like everywhere else where it's kind of transitioning. So there's, that's going to be the easy part, the real estate component, your, your part, the most difficult part is going to be world-class providers so that when you open a location and people go in there, they get an experience like they can't get anywhere else and they become raving fans. And then you need people to just run that operation and take care of everything so you can be the visionary and pop in and you know just make sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to do from a provider standpoint. Your CEO doesn't have to be a provider, but they need to be somebody who can lead you know, that team and build that organization once you get to that level. Yeah. And that's, that's where we are right now. I am replacing myself slowly. Um, I love the CEO role and we're rolling out EOS and doing a bunch of that work right now as well. Um, getting ready to hire people to continue to replace me in that role. So I enjoy that. I also find myself in the position where Andy and Jenny were talking about, which is hiring that, that, integrator um in yeah. the US world so right you need a ceo you need a second in command yeah you need somebody that that's what they want to do um and again you need you need the right person there yeah yeah it's fun yeah cool yeah i help a lot of people with with that all around the world okay. i have some people you know international that same same thing they're scaling and the biggest piece is you know how do i build that team find the right people and lead lead them to success and coach yes. them to success um get those one minute manager books and read those um, those will help you a lot. Have you done disc profiling with all your people yet or personality profiling? Not with everybody. We've done it, but not with them. Um, but that's coming. Yeah, it's that's a big one. Then the next with 2024 is placing all of that. Yeah, EOS and traction, all that's great. But yeah. the people, the human component yeah. is the most important component. And that's the biggest thing they leave out, you know, is how to deal with people, how to, you know, just just the emotional intelligence, you know, right. all of that. Agree completely. Thank you so much. Greg, would you have any um, guidance to give them specifically on how to get lending for those pieces of real estate before they've created the additional income stream, right? So they go to the bank and they say, we want to buy 123 Main Street. Once we create it as our practice, it will generate this much revenue, but it has zero revenue today. How would you navigate that from the lending perspective? So we'll, you know, you want to shop local banks, but SBA is probably going to be your best bet. That's what we did with our current space. Um, that is so painful. And I don't intend on doing that again. <laughs> uh, but that's exactly what we did for our current building. Yeah, that's the least expensive out of pocket. But, you know, right. banks, local local regional banks are your best bet. They'll finance you all day long. They, they you know, they don't care about cash flow when it comes to a medical practice. They know it's going to be there. Right. Yeah. Thank you both. Yeah, absolutely. Jessica, one thing that I, is a little bit different than, than specifically, you know, your situation, but I think it's similar enough that I'll mention it is once we had a track record of turning apartment buildings around, we could then say, Hey, we're going to buy this thing. And yes, it's 50% vacant, but here are all the others that we turned around and here was the pre rent roll and the post rent roll and all of that. Um, so we were able to get lending that, you know, generally wouldn't be available. So perhaps you can use, you know, the, the P and L's from your current practices to say, this is what I'll be putting in this in this physical space. And that might help you, particularly with local regional banks where they're able to build a relationship. Yeah, that's that is exact all of this is exactly where we are right now. I have a, a fractional CFO coming in and helping me run all of that. Um yeah. pro forma and those numbers. Um and our current building was ground up construction. I bought land and then mm. and went through that as yeah. well. So it's just as you You've said, got all the hard stuff first, so it'll just get just easier. Do from it. Here. Yes, uh, hopefully, hopefully that's the idea. Awesome. Is the scaling part will be, will be successful, of course. And yeah, and, and you know, scary. find a mentor. You know, 
it doesn't have to be me, but get a mentor to help you. So you have somebody that you can pick up the phone and call anytime and help you through those things. Yeah. Um, you know, the development process, all that would have been just a piece of cake with the right mentor. Yeah. So, you know, that's going to, you will compress time and collapse time with a mentor. You'll be, you'll be light years ahead. So yeah. get somebody on your side, um, you know, to help you with everything you're doing. And when it comes to shopping local banks, when I say shop local banks, I mean all of them because yeah. every bank's different, you know, at every point in time, they all have different, you know, appetites at different times and different motivations at different times. So you really need to shop like every bank in your market and you just never know what's going to, what's going to come out of it. And even the SBA process, that's, you know, once you get a CFO on board, they can handle that and you don't have to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. And that'll be, that'll be next. Yeah. It's just paperwork. Yeah. Awesome. Let me shoot you an email. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for the question. One of our greatest um, lending wins was a bank that, you know, we had been in a relationship with for probably four or five years. And we were just getting, you know, polite no's, but we would have lunch with them maybe twice a year or something like that. And then one day they called out of the blue and they said, we'd like the opportunity to refinance your entire single family home portfolio. And we're like, what happened? Like, Hi, how you know, how are you? It was just a, an awkward phone call. And they said that simultaneously they had had a farmer who had unexpectedly paid off like an $80 million loan. So they had all this capital to place and they wanted to pivot specifically to residential real estate. They had had a lot of farming uh, lending. Um, and that just really solidified for me. Like you just need to be in relationships with banks. Sometimes they have capital to lend. Sometimes they don't. They have a board. They, you know, their people are making decisions, their board changes. A no is never a no. You just stay in relationship with them, genuinely provide them with value, genuinely show them what you're up to, the deals that you've done, even if they're not the lender on it. And then things change and then they have, you know, more lending opportunities. So it's just a, a, a funny story from years and years ago that I wanted to share there. Grace, your hand is up. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Greg. Um, learned a lot so far, but you're talking about multifamily and how that maybe isn't the most favorable thing right now when compared to some of these other cash flow options. Um, I'm currently in the short-term rental space and have gotten um, comfortable with that and wanted to move into the larger multifamily space with some partners. And so I wanted to see if you could elaborate a little bit more and like, should I be looking at other more fun sounding options like car washes or like, or should we um, continue going forward with multifamily just, and, and like what, when does it make sense in today's market? And what are you looking for in a particular market to say that deal makes sense? Is it mostly like appreciation if the cash flow isn't great right now, kind of look at what the market appreciation is or something like that? Yeah. So again, it all goes back to your goals and what you're looking for. And if you're looking for the highest cash flow possible now, then, you know, you just have to look at each asset. And the problem with multifamily, so multifamily is the most scalable, right? So you can do big deals, you can put numbers together real fast. So you can mitigate some of that through scale, but you have to, you know, raise a lot of capital and, you know, those types of things. For typical syndicators, it's mostly these days, there's very little cash flow. It's a fee-based business, acquisition fees, uh, uh, and disposition fees, you know, and then hopefully if you can add value and make a spread on the back end that you're splitting with your investors, that's how syndicators make money. They're money managers. It's a fee-based business. Um, you know, Nick and Elaine's model is a little different because they don't sell. They refinance, pay investors back, and they keep going. So they're long-term. So they're looking to pay stuff off eventually. But, you know, they can, they can as interest rates change, they can leverage that and bring that cash flow, you know, in the line as interest rates change. So right now, as far as multifamily goes as a space, values are still relatively high. There are some assets that are trading at a discount. Uh, so you can get some good deals right now on distressed assets, but you got to be ready to jump in and close. Um, so you want to be in tune with that. And you can find those through brokers. You can find those through bankers, um, special assets, uh, managers at banks, or the REO department, real estate owned. So a special assets manager is going to manage properties that um, are in default. And then once the bank takes them back through foreclosure, it's real estate owned and the bank owns it. So the banks will have some some of those that they can tell you about. Um, and then, you know, brokers stay in front of them. But, um, you know, that's kind of where you are in multifamily right now. Sellers still have not really come off of those 2020, 20, you know, 2021 prices. 
even though it's you know 2024 now they're still stuck two three years ago when cap rates you know were at three and four when cap rates now are at six and seven a lot yeah. of sellers still are not you know because they don't have to you know they're not budging so you got to look for distressed assets for the highest cash flow if that's what you're looking for and then yeah you know it, it depends on what size deals you want to do if you're just looking for the best cash flows and you need to an analyze what's available in your market and do the numbers and you know see what cash flows the best and then scale through numbers of assets you know versus each property you know just bigger yeah. properties but um multifamily can be good you know everybody has to have a roof over their head so it's it's one of the it's a bond what so what's happened in multifamily has become a bond play so in, investors are willing to pay more because it's a safer bet than you know an office building or a car wash or a retail center retail centers are good cash flows typically and you can typically build you know pretty good value but again you're doing, you know, small properties, you know, two, three, four, five million dollar properties versus you can do a hundred million dollar multifamily deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Any follow-up questions, Grace? No, I think we just got to look at the goals and see what we want. Like clearly if I want cash flow right now, some of these, a lot of these deals aren't going to make sense. Right. But they might in 10 years. Hold. Yeah. They might make sense in 10 years. Again, mm -hmm. if you've got cash flow, you can even be negative for a little while if you feel like, you know, hey, we might be able to refinance, change rates. So let's talk about interest rates for a second yeah. because, you know, this keeps coming up. So again, interest rates are at nominal levels right now. They're they're normal. Nor you know, they have normalized. So if you look at a chart of the Fed funds rate and look at real estate, you'll see whenever Fed funds rate hit hits the level that we're at now, the Fed typically would cut over the last number of years. And then typically you'd see a recession come in after the Fed starts cutting and you see the real estate market, um, you know, have issues and things like that. Kind of doesn't make sense if rates are coming down. Why would the real estate market crash? Well, that's because typically there's a recession. It's very different right now because we're not in a recessionary environment. The economy's strong. There's still more jobs and there are people willing to take them, you know, things like that. So what you really need to be watching when it comes to interest rates, you need to watch the number one, the Fed. What is the Fed telling you they're going to do? Where do? When do they see rates coming down? Uh, and specifically, when does Jay Powell see rates coming down? And that's where that nuanced language comes in. But he's usually pretty clear about that. He'll tell you, we don't see rate cuts, not even talking about it till June or July or August or whatever it is. We might have two cuts this year. So he, when he speaks Wednesday, he will tell you where he sees cuts coming in. Forget the dot plot. That's kind of neat. You can see where people are. It's what he's telling you. And he's very deliberate in what he's telling you for a reason. So he's going to tell you where rates are headed. But watch the job market and, uh, you know, liquidity. So, you know, the money supply. And right now, financial conditions are very loose. The money supply is, is you know, um, ample. There's a lot of money and liquidity out there. So that's kind of what's driving things. So, you know, when it comes to liquidity and credit markets, when it gets difficult to get loans or you can't get loans and interest rates, um, you know, are dropping rapidly, and people are losing their jobs. So that's what a real recession is, job loss at scale, where people are losing jobs at scale. When the construction yeah. industry slows down and they're losing jobs and the car dealers are laying people off because nobody's buying cars and you know those types of things, that's when you know you got a problem and you'll see rates come down rapidly. You know, And that's when conditions can really change. That's when you want to refinance everything, right? It's when mm -hmm. all that happens. Mm -hmm. um, you know, So that's kind of your crystal ball into the future where we're at, but right now, you know, yeah. recession's not on the table at the moment. Do you have predictions on <laughs> when that's going to happen? Like, I mean, you know, gotta... right now it just doesn't look like there will be one because inflation yeah. has stabilized at 3%, but it's stabilized. Um, you would need a severe spike in inflation for the Fed to have to get really aggressive. You know, people worry about the national debt. You know, is that is that a real thing to worry about? I don't know. There's a modern monetary theory out there that's in practice that, because we are the world's reserve currency, we can create as much debt as we want because we can print money to service the debt. I don't agree with that. But right now there's been no negative re repercussions mm -hmm. of trillions of dollars in debt, like none other than, mm -hmm. other than asset inflation. That's where we're seeing it in the markets and in real estate. Um, you know, so the Fed has no real control over that. And then, you know, the government spending. So we're in an election cycle. So, the, so you know, the, the government, the administration is going to spend to buy votes to try to stay in office. So that's gonna stimulate the economy. Uh, so right now, I mean, recession is just not on the table. Again, the number one leading indicator of recession is job losses at scale at the you know blue collar level. 
that's when you've got a problem. Not white collar, you know, IT. Those companies are bloated anyways because that's how they increase valuation. You know, if you've got 10,000 employees and you're a tech company, well, you got a big valuation. You know, so they they don't need half of them anyways. They're just doing that to just, you know, be able to, you know, be able to kind of say they're a big company. And you're seeing some layoffs and, you know, in the tech industry and things like that. But they just, you know, again, they didn't need them to begin with. You saw Elon Musk take over Twitter and he got rid of like 80% of the people and the thing did not miss a beat. So, yeah. you know, tech is bloated. When you see mechanics losing their job, when you see construction workers losing their job, when you see restaurant workers losing their job, when people stop spending money, that's when you got a problem. So that's all you got to watch. And, you know, I don't see that happening. People are no. still spending strong. The yeah. economy's still humming along. Everybody's, you know, so the people that have money have money. And then the people that don't are really feeling it. So there might be people on here that are, that are feeling it. And I, I get that, you know, inflation is tough right now, you know, for a lot of people and people that you employ are probably feeling it, but you know, the upper level incomes, we're not feeling it, right? We can do whatever we want and it doesn't really matter. I mean, we think about it, you know, it's kind of like, dang, are eggs really $5 or $10? Yeah, seven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Butter. Have you bought butter lately? Yeah. <laughs> and it's insane. Yeah. What the heck? So, you know, there's things like that, um, you know, that we kind of think about, but that we're not going to stop. We're not going to change our behavior. So when you see behaviors change, you see job losses, then, you know, you got a real recession. But until then, it's yeah. just academic. Even if you have negative GDP, I don't care. The definition is negative GDP two two quarters in a row. I mean, that's, you know, real recession is job losses at, at you know, at scale. That's a real recession. One thing I wonder is if that just isn't going to happen because of population dynamics and changes that happened through COVID and so many people permanently left the workforce or are willing to work fewer hours in the gig economy. And that's, you know, way outside of the scope of, of today. But I wonder if we're in some sort of semi permanent, right? Nothing's permanent, but, but semi permanent change in the ratio of humans to jobs, technology and AI and things are going to change that, but it might be, you know, longer than, than we anticipate, but yeah, we two you know, so the biggest thing is what we're not seeing is the gig worker, right? So there's a lot of people that, you know, that make money that don't actually show up on any of the, any of the, you know, polls that they take or the, st you know, statistics that they do. So there's a lot of gig workers, there's a lot of remote workers, there's, you know, there's a lot of people working two and three jobs, especially in the tech industry, you know, Google employees working for Apple and Microsoft at the same time, you know, so it's, it's really interesting how the world has changed and how, how much money's out there. And then you add like the stock market and the wealth that was built there and real estate and crypto and things like that. People, people that have money have a lot of money mm -hmm. and, you know, that's kind of what's sustaining things as far as artificial intelligence and stuff, sure, that'll replace some jobs here and there, but it's mostly just going to make us more productive and you need people to run, you know, the AI. So, you know, yeah. that doesn't scare me right now. Um, and it's just a machine. So if you're worried about, you know, AI eating the world, just unplug it. <laughs> All right, well, we have two more folks that will do live coaching. And then I think I have maybe six, quite, I need to read through them, but I think I have maybe five or six written questions. The written questions look pretty fast. Why don't we try to wrap up in say maybe 25 minutes or so? So that'll be our pacing. Um, does that sound good for you with you, Greg? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, because it's right. 10 p.m. Eastern right. where I'm at. Meredith and then Ming, and then I will go through the written questions and then we'll wrap up. Hi, Greg. Thank you so much. This has been incredibly valuable. Um, and I'm going to actually follow up on what Grace Grace's question. Um, and actually, it was funny, she just put a comment in that car washes sound a whole lot more fun than multifamily. Um, and that's really funny, because my so I've I've just got the real estate bug and love it. And I'm so excited about it. But in listening to you, what I realized was that to be able to do real estate the way I want, I need cash flow so I can get out of my W-2. And so all of a sudden I'm listening to you and I'm thinking car washes, hotels, and self-storage. And my question though is those those are are businesses that need to be run. So do if you're going to look to make that play, are you going to find people to run those businesses for you? I'm just trying to conceptualize in like sort of actually really think about it in a real operational way as opposed to just as a concept. Yeah. So either third party management companies that manage those for you or uh, individual to come manage them for you. But like self-storage, there's third party management companies and hotels, uh, car washes as well. 
and ideally you want automated car washes that, you know, you're, you don't have employees. Those, those are the best car washes to own. And then also, you know, flex industrial can be good in some areas, depending on where you're at. And those are easy, uh, easy flex type that. of assets to manage. Flex industrial is like, you know, little industrial parks where you might have a 10,000 square foot building. It's got an auto, you know, auto mechanic shop in there and maybe an auto body and maybe a little contractors in there, you know, um, little metal buildings that you see around that could be even be freestanding 2000, 5,000 square foot. Those are great, easy, you know, assets to own and manage. And those usually have pretty good cash flows too. Light industrial, well, flex industrial. Okay. That's, that's amazing. So there are actually third parties. I see this, the, of course there are, it just doesn't occur to me. There are people that you can hire and that are professionals at doing things like running a car wash. Yeah. Just like there's management companies that manage houses, you know, property managers that manage houses yeah. and manage multifamily. They manage these other assets as well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Thanks for the question, Meredith. Ming, what's on your mind tonight? Thank you so much for the coaching, Greg. Like, uh, very, very valuable. Like, uh, I need to listen again, like, many, many more times. Um, couple of the questions, like, uh, you mentioned, like, the narrower as a class, like, the broader, you will need to go for the area. Uh, and then, like, if you, so, like, the opposite probably, like, uh, if you, if you do, like, a narrow area then like you have to go to like a uh, many different kind of uh, asset class right um so which one is better like um to do like a um, narrow asset class and then like broader area or like um uh be expert in like uh an area and like uh be open to many different asset classes yeah so it's better to become an expert locally where you are now because once you do that you can apply that to any other market so the fundamentals of real estate and development are the same in any market once you understand how to analyze a market. So you want to develop your buy box, become an expert in your market, and then you can apply those same fundamentals anywhere around the, anywhere around the country and in most areas of the world as well. Um, is there any possibility that like uh, an area is really like not really suitable for acquisition? Uh, or we are in DC metro area, like uh, uh, so far, like my impression is like, uh, it's very, very hard to acquire, let's say, multifamily uh, around this area, like, uh, of course, like a uh, high capital and also like a uh, to cash flow. Um, so uh, you mentioned like uh, to to be expert uh, in our area, right? Like, uh, of course, like there might be like some industrial, there might be like uh, uh, some self storage that might be able to be acquired. Um, so yeah, we'd like to know your opinion. Yeah, so DC's, you know, big, that's the number one housing, you know, market in the country. It's a it's a big commercial real estate market. So when you go outside of B DC, you know, and get get around the suburbs around DC, we you can find some things like Springfield, Centerville, Woodbridge. That's where it gets a little bit more affordable and accessible. And there's a lot of different types of assets. The closer in you get to DC, the more expensive it gets and the more, uh, you know, difficult it becomes for you to be a buyer on an entry level. So I would look more on the outskirts, you know, because uh, you've got a lot of territory around you. And then you've got Maryland as well, um, you know, that, the, you know, that, that DMV area. So mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of opportunity there. So I'd become an expert there and that that will translate anywhere, you know, anywhere else in the country. And that that's a great insulated market for all types of real estate. Even office is doing well in general. I mean, some assets went back to the bank in DC, but in general, all asset types and classes are doing well in, in the DC area. I see. Uh, Where all the it... money is. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it looks like a, Sounds like you're very, very familiar with this area. I don't know. Uh, you probably like have invested or like uh, live uh, around this yeah, area. Yeah, North Carolina to Virginia up into D.C. That's been my region over the last 30 years. I see. Got it. Uh, and then like you say, any specific uh, characteristic for asset uh, class? Let's say like uh, which one cash flow better, which one appreciates better, like uh, um, or yeah, like um, any specific um, any specific in specific uh, asset class? So, you know, as far as appreciation, um, you know, multifamily is going to be the fastest racehorse when cap rates are coming down. You know, the, the, the values are going to go up quick. Other asset classes aren't, you know, because again, that's the bond play of real estate. So they're going to carry the biggest value, the fastest. Um, development has always had the biggest returns. And that's the ones that generate the biggest values because you're, you're creating your equity when you build it. So development is a good, good way to build uh, a lot of equity and to get, you know, better returns, ground up development. Um, but, you know, it's going to be different in different markets. Uh, multifamily in general across the country, you know, those those have generally been the easiest ones to push value because they're the most desirable 
by the biggest money out there. So that's kind of where it's at, you know, and then it kind of steps down from there. Okay. Hotels are, are better cash flows, but their cap rates aren't as high because it's an operational, you know, it's a retail play. It's, it requires operations. So, uh, you know, they're going to trade at higher cap rates than multifamily. Multifamily trades at the lowest cap rates. Uh, and then next would be trophy office buildings. Uh, you know, trophy office buildings like in oh, D.C. Building? What, what trophy would be iconic office buildings. So, you know, in D.C., there are certain office buildings that are iconic. Uh, you know, like in New York City, the World Trade Center, well, not the World Trade Center, but the Empire State Building is a trophy mm -hmm. asset. Chrysler Building is a trophy asset. Those are legacy assets that typically, you know, a family or sovereign wealth fund just owns and they don't care. They'll pay a two cap for it because, you know, it's it's a store of value. So it's a bond type play. Okay, I see. Yeah, it's very high capital to enter. Yeah. Okay, thank you thank so much. You. Um, thank you for the questions. I have six written questions and then Matthew, if we have time, we can get to your question and then wrap up. So we'll think of these as like ultra fast ultra flash coaching, Greg, I have several questions of various situations of folks who have a personal residence, have good incomes, good credit scores, a lot of equity in their personal home, and they're having trouble unlocking that equity with HELOCs right now. So any recommendations for that or any specific lenders? Yeah. So again, you need to, you're going to need to talk to a lot of different banks and, and um, you know, see if you can get that line of credit, just a general line of credit. I mean, you can even you can do a home equity loan or you know home equity line of credit, but you're just gonna have to talk to a lot of different banks, and it really is gonna depend because values are kind of sticky right now with interest rates where they are. You know that's really gonna be the key, and they're only gonna give you so much. They're not gonna give you 100% of your equity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would I would say very similar is uh, local banks are always better, and just keep making the calls. Um, you know, personal is a little easier than investment properties, but we have many HELOCs on investment properties. I think we work with like 30 banks and like one or two of them do HELOCs on investment properties. Personal is a little bit easier, but just because you get no from one bank, just go to the next. They're, they all have different risk profiles. They all have different amounts of capital that they would like to lend, all of those things. Yeah. And you should be able to get a general <laughs> business line of credit too. If you've got a business or a practice and you have a you know bank account where you've got, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, you know, a year or a month rolling through them, a bank will give you a line of credit, you know, generally, you know, at least minimum what your monthly cash flow is that you're putting through the bank. So, uh, you know, uh, talk to your bank about that as well for your business. Mm -hmm. Um, a question we had is curious to know why hotels are considered to cash flow well in this era of Airbnb, VRBO, homeexchange.com, those sorts of things. Same reason. So as far as residential real estate, you know, short-term rentals cash flow the highest, then mid-term rentals cash flow next, and then long-term rentals cash flow the least. Um, hotels, it's dynamic pricing. You can change the rate, you know, day to day. So, you know, that's that's why they cash flow the most. You're selling in the room by the night, just like, you know, Airbnb. Right. And then um, you have the other, you know, ancillary, you know, retail sales, you know, different goods, like little, you know, goods and services they have at the different hotels. Um, What thoughts do you have on parking lots as investments or parking structures? Yeah, those can be good. It's just, you just got to run the numbers and, you know, try to get the best, you know, opportunity for the dollar. The thing I think about there is operationalizing it. So things like a gate, credit card machines, um, cameras, other, you know, basically kind of like what happened in self-storage where there was a big boom in self-storage because people brought tech to self-storage. So bringing tech to a parking lot could drastically increase the value. Um, what resources would you recommend for how to learn how to analyze properties? So the... Uh... You know, there's books out there, you know, on that in terms of, you know, how to analyze properties. But the best way to do it is to start looking at them. So depending on what type of property you're looking at, you know, you want to read the offering memorandum that the broker puts together and read it word for word. Look at the numbers, understand where the numbers come from. And, um, you know, Google that on YouTube, you know, handle how to analyze whatever type of property you're looking at. You'll see all kinds of stuff, you know, come up that show you how to do it. But again, you want to keep it simple. So read the offering memorandum. When you analyze a property, you're looking at the area. You're looking at the asset, the condition, the numbers, the rent rolls, you know, things like that. It's income and expenses. So it's it's not complicated. 
You're looking at what's the income coming in, what are the expenses going out, and the key is to understand what those should be for that type of you know asset in that area. So you know that's the best way to do it is just by looking at deals, read the read the offering memorandums, read the numbers, talk to the brokers about it. And uh, you know when you see discrepancies, call them up, say, hey, I was going through the offering memorandum, interested in the property. You know, I see your rents are only fifteen hundred a month when they're getting eighteen hundred a month down the street. What do you think's going on here? And they'll usually show you what the property's doing and what they think it'll do. And then you can call them up and say, well, tell me how you think it's doing this. And they'll show you different comps and why they think, you know, that you can get the income up, the expenses down, things like that. That's how you learn by, you know, analyzing, talking and asking good questions. Good answer there. Um, Matthew, was was your question the one that I answer that I read ver verbally or do you, would you have another one that you would like to do? Yes, I, I do have another one. Thank, yeah, thank you. Yeah, both. take take us home. Finish us up tonight. It's been fantastic. Um, <clears throat> my question is, uh, Greg, do you have any thoughts on um, ways to avoid capital gains when you sell? Uh, I'm a small time investor. I've got a handful of residential properties. I'm passive, so uh, uh, it's not my primary work. In other words, uh, but when I recently sold one home. I ended up investing in a DST, which seemed safe, uh, you know, not flashy, pretty conservative, uh, just not thrilling. And uh, I'm wondering what um, a guy like you thinks about uh, DSTs and more uh, operationally, how to avoid capital gains when you do sell. Yeah. So, you know, deferred sales trusts are one, but that's deferred. You know, um, you could also do a 1031 exchange. Um you know, where equal or, you know, like kind exchanges. So there's 1031 exchanges that you can do, but the number one way um, to avoid it altogether is through a self-directed Roth IRA. Um, so you can roll all of your, if you've got 401ks, you got IRAs, you can roll all those into a self-directed Roth IRA and you can use that to buy your real estate. And there's no um, taxes on any of the gains, you know, and there's no taxes when you pull money out, you know, after 65 and a half or whatever, whatever age it is uh, that you start taking your distributions. That's on a Roth IRA. So I would mm -hmm. talk to your investment advisors about that. And if you've got money in your retirement accounts, you can roll it all into a self Roth IRA, um, mm -hmm. self directed Roth IRA. You can even, this is a little bit more complicated and technical. You're going to need a custodian to help you do that, you know, to administer the checks, or you can set up an LLC that your Roth IRA owns. And then you can write the checks yourself. You don't even, you don't even have to go through um, a custodian. But the safest way to do it if you have no self-control is to go through a custodian so you don't mess up and do prohibited transactions. Um, but that, that's the best way to avoid it altogether. Other than that, you know, some other ways to kind of defer it and stretch it out is to do installment sale. So finance it you know, and take payments over years, and you can spread the tax burden out over, over years and things like that. But mm -hmm. self-directed Roth IRA, you can use that for stocks. You can use it for, you know, gold, crypto. You can use it for real estate. I mean, that's a powerful, powerful vehicle to build a retirement account tax-free. You know, uh, and grow it tax-free. Greg, when when you when you say deals, do you mean passive deals and other people's deals, like it, it, or are you referring to active deals that the person with the Roth would do? And if so, how do you get around regulations of self-dealing? Well, because it's investment property. So you can't, it can't be a permanent residence, primary residence. So yeah, you can do LP investments or you can buy the asset, you know, because your IRA owns the asset. So as long as you don't own it. So if you're just buying property and it's an investment property, it's the IRA that owns the property, not you. So you can't sell a property to the IRA that you own, uh, you know, to your Roth IRA, but you can buy properties with it. Um, you can finance properties with your IRA, but it has to be non-recourse. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of powerful ways to leverage and take advantage of a self-directed Roth IRA. So look up, you know, self-directed Roth IRA for real estate. There's lots of books out there and lots of stuff on YouTube about it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. I, I actually, I actually thing. didn't, I, I, I wasn't a hundred percent familiar with that. I thought that there were self-dealing regulations and there was a, a question in the chat. So I'm glad that we did this. Yeah, that's this only if, you know, you own the property, you know, it just has to be investment property you don't own. Got it. Um, and businesses, you, your businesses too. I mean, you can, you can, your Roth IRA can own a business that you can work for the business. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, th thank you, Matthew. Great. Thank, thank you. you, Greg, for coming on tonight and doing the questions that I put together and doing the flash coaching. If anyone wants to 
learn more about Greg, get in touch with Greg. His website is Dickerson International. You can contact him through the website. Nick and I have worked with him for years. And um, I mean, it is no exaggeration to say we would have, you know, 30, 45 minute phone calls that would be worth a million dollars, right? When you're making, you're making $10 million decisions, it's easy to sway the decision in a, you know, a million plus or minus with, with really good guidance. So, so excited to have all of you meet Greg tonight. I hope you all learn something, feel invigorated, know that there are always opportunities in the market. It's all just about pivoting and staying ahead of trends and finding your own unfair advantage and putting in hard work and leveraging people. And I hope you learned a ton from Greg tonight, dickersoninternational.com if you'd like to be in touch with Greg or learn more about him. Greg, any last final parting words for us? One question I didn't get to that if you feel so moved to kind of end on this or any other final words you have. Um, the question I had was, what is the single best piece of real estate wisdom you have ever heard? <laughs> <laughs> no pressure on that one. Maybe we can say what's in the top three, but any other parting words you have for us? Don't provide equity and guarantee the debt. <laughs> No, so the best is go big. You know, if your goal is to go big, go big. Just, you know, if there's one thing I could do over again, it would be to, you know, have gone much bigger earlier, but I just didn't know. I didn't, I didn't have me. And, you know, I just didn't know what I didn't know back then. So, you know, there's no excuse. You can go as big as you want to go. I've seen, you know, Nick and Elaine go from, you know, nothing to hundreds of millions. You know, Vic and Ravi went from a hundred million to almost a billion in a couple of years. So there really is no limits. The only limits are what you put on yourself and what you put up here. So, you know, take an inventory of where you're at, write down where it is you want to go. And then, you know, ask yourself, why are you where you are now? Because there's only three things you're missing, you know, to get where you want to be. That's going to be the deals. That's going to be the expertise. That's going to be the capital, right? Um, so we just got to fill in those gaps. But really, you need to know where it is you want to go so that we can reverse engineer that success, look at other people that, you know, are where you want to be, have done what you want to do and, and, you know, can get you where you want to go and you want to surround yourself with those people so you can collapse time. That's the key. The resources are out there. So where do you want to be? Where are you now? And we're going to figure out those, you know, one or two things that you need to focus on to get you where you want to be. And just don't let anything stop you. You know, <laughs> two words, I will, not I can, not I, you know, uh, you know, round to it or think I will and just do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I have certainly found that scale actually makes things easier in a lot of ways because you can hire specialists, you can get different equipment, you can get better software. There's just things that you can do with scale that are harder to do when you're smaller. So scale is not only not scary, it's often the ticket to I don't know what quite the word is, but peace and tranquility. That's what made my see. life easier, you know, having yeah. all the companies and all that. And, you know, because you can put people and processes and systems in place to do it all for you. So, you know, it is easier. Bigger deals are easier to do. They're easier to finance. It's easier to raise money for. But there's nothing wrong with going small. You know, so you want to figure out, again, where what is it that you want to do? Let's get there. And then you can see, you know, it's like the railroad tracks, right? You stand on a railroad tracks and you look down, you can only see so far. But then when you walk to where you can see, well, now you can see much further. So just pick something to get started with. Even if you haven't done a deal yet, let's pick a deal, pick a goal, and then get that one done and then go from there. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Greg, for your decades of wisdom, for everything you've done to help Nick and I along the journey over the past several years, for being here and staying with us till 1030 at night, Eastern time. I appreciate that a great deal.